my name is Aleem Shabazz, and I'm, my organization is Crescent Sports Media. And today, we will be talking about Muslim athletes, activism, and Islam. Uh, to my right, I have Imam Rakib Abdubar. He is the resident Imam of Sacramento Islamic Resource Center. We'd like to welcome you, and we will be talking about Muslim athletes and activism. Imam, uh, could you please tell us uh, about the Islamic, Sacramento Islamic Resource Center? Yeah, no problem. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi well, wabarakatuh. Thank you for inviting me um, to this program. Um, the Sacramento Islamic Resource Center was uh, an idea that came about uh, from me uh, being a chaplain, certified chaplain in uh, the California Department of Corrections. Uh, that's how, well, that's what originally brought me here to California. Um, upon graduating from college and um, doing my residency and chaplaincy, um, we decided to, you know, broaden our scope a little bit. Um, I've been doing chaplaincy for 30 years, so the bar has risen for chaplains to get into certain mm -hmm. uh, institutions as far as colleges, as mm -hmm. far as prison systems, et cetera, et cetera. So we did our residency after our resi graduating from our residency, California Department of Corrections uh, uh, contacted us, offered us employment. We moved out here, but in my uh, development within the system and finding out the California system, getting reinvolved into the institution of, institutionalism of conservation, I found that we could do more for individuals coming out of the prison than we can in. Quite naturally, you have to have someone in, a Muslim chaplain in, to be able to you know, propagate the dean and also teach the dean. But at the same time, these young men and women need resources when they come out. They need some type of connection to get back into the community. So the Islamic Resource, the Sacramento Islamic Resource Center, came up from an idea because we have masjids. We don't need any more masjids. We need resources that can develop into educational institutions. So the resource center was developed to bring our people into a situation where we can help them get back into society with either jobs, uh, correcting the miseducation of the Islamic institutional Islamic education that they had, um, also doing counseling as far as drug abuse, uh, um, uh, uh, substance abuse, um, grief counseling, marital counseling, uh, premarital counseling, postmarital counseling, um, and these are type some of the resources that we have that we are developing. We are also politically trying to get involved with city organizations as far as establishing ESL as a second language for the immigrant Muslims that come, immigrant and, and uh, Muslims and non-Muslims um, in the center, as well as establishing a monthly clinic within the, the um, uh, office building to be able to allow people to have a simple checkup, blood test, uh, blood pressure test, diabetes test, et cetera, et cetera. These little simple things are sometimes overlooked because some people either do not have the resources or the insurance to do so, or they just bypass, haphazardly bypass those types of things. So these are the types of things that the Resource Center wanted to do. Within the Resource Center, we do have our musalla within the building to um, you know, establish our Islamic rights, our, our prayer services. We hold uh, Arabic classes for beginnings and for those who are advanced. We have an Islamic study class for those new converts or reverts whatever word you want to use, um, that's coming into Islam, as well as a refresher course, and other things with, uh, that, that we have to do Islamically. But the resource part of the center is, is the driving thrust. Okay. Because during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu um, the masjid, per se, or the mosque, per se, was the center of society. And we've gotten away from that particular thinking. So this, this also was a brain thrust as far as why we wanted to name it Resource Center. We want to bring the people back to what a masjid actually is supposed to do within the society or within their locale. 
Well, it sounds uh, very uh, appropriate mm. during these times. Mm -hmm. um, in that resource center, would you also, uh, briefly, would you also have um, workforce development for maybe the youth, uh, CTE, career technical education? Uh, and your background is in, uh, I believe you did get a degree in uh, Bachelor of Science in Electronics, is that? Yes, I have a Bachelor uh, uh, in Electronics, bachelor, BS in, um, BS, <laughs> Bachelor's <laughs> of Science <laughs> in Islamic, uh, Islamic Studies as well as Electronics. Okay. And then I also have my Master's in, in Chaplaincy. And, and that's an excellent question. Now, the thing about th that question is, is I'm almost going to answer it with, with a question, is how people, especially our people, see the imam within a center. The imam is supposed to do everything, right? So when you have a resource center, that means that you have to have or help develop or have an, uh, an atmosphere where people that have those particular skills can come off of their skills okay. in order to be able to produce that. So we will hopefully, inshallah, be able to do that when the right person comes along to be able to put that in place. Okay. That's so, like so it'll be open to anyone that have that type of skill and that type of expertise as well as education to be able to put that in place. Okay, we're, we're, we're calling people to Sacramento Islamic, Islamic Resource, Resource Center. Center. That's right. And uh, your skills and your talent will be well uh, received. Yes. Uh, now let's get to uh, the crux of what the program is about. Mm -hmm. The Muslim athlete and activism of the Muslim athlete in, in, in America and worldwide. I think that when you look at the, the Muslim influence on, uh, uh, I guess, sports, the sports world, in today's time is more of an entertainment. It is not structured, from my personal opinion, it is not structured in the sense of activism in the sense that uh, our athletes are politically astute enough to uh, organize a coalition amongst themselves. Mm. Everyone in society that believe in a cause organize themselves into an organization or into a coalition Whereas when certain subject matters that are pertinent to them, they come out as one voice and they speak either for or against this, whatever is going on in society, whether it's socialism, whether it's a social aspect of society or political aspect of society or, you know, injustice of society or, or the justice of society. It doesn't always have to be negative. It can be something that's positive. So what we have within the Muslim athlete uh, today, maybe compared to uh, 30, 40 years ago mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali and Jim Brown and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, when those individuals stood behind Muhammad Ali when he right, refused right, the right, draft, right, right, right. there was a voice. There mm -hmm. was athletes. So you saw all of your... If you looked at them as being entertainers, they took you out of that light and presented themselves mm. as an educated political mm. force to say, mm. no, this is an injustice being done to this man, and this is what we are saying, and we are going to stand up behind him. Today, there's more individualism, like when Colin Kaepernick made his stance, you had individuals with him at that particular time, but as the heat came on him, everybody dissipated. You know, they say if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen, right? right, right so right. when the kitchen got hot, people ran. The brother made a stance. Whether I agree with totally what he did or what he's done afterwards is not the issue. The fact that what he was trying to bring attention to was justice, was injustice, and it was justified for him to do so. But people kind of, you know, left the man hanging. Okay. Very, very good... Um uh, comparison um, and also with Muhammad Ali there was a, a tremendous tremendous cause of why he did what he did he knew why he did it and he was willing long term to uh, suffer the consequence of his action mm -hmm. 
Is that the same thing that you're seeing today, or is it more, um, I'm, I'm making a statement, and I hope this doesn't affect my economics? <laughs> <laughs> a law controls your economics, Zach. Um, I think that, no, you don't see that today, because you have to, you have to also remember um, two things that was happening in that particular time. Um, during the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, African Americans as a people were still being oppressed in this society socially and politically. You know, we were still looked at less as a human being. So there was an urgency to bring upon justice as well as a recognition of, of manhood, well, starting with humanhood, manhood, economic situations. How are you going to take control of all of that over an individual or a group of individuals? Whereas today's athlete is making millions upon mm, millions yes, of dollars. Yeah, right, right, you follow right, what I'm right. saying? So there is no urgency within society. The only urgency that comes up in society today is when an African-American youth or, or sister, brother or sister is getting shot down in the street or getting beat up in the street um, by police forces or what have you. But society in this Me Too movement has made people forget that injustices or social development or I shouldn't say forget, but numb them down to the development of the human being within society because everything has come together. Right. So as everything has come together, why should you argue? Why should you fight? Why should there be an urgency? Yes. Um, Craig Hodges, mm. he's a three times uh, NBA uh, all-star for three-pointers. Mm. Um, I believe in, I'm not sure, I believe in 1991 he uh, made a statement uh, by going to the White House in uh, what he called a daishiki mm. and a kufi mm. and uh, basically handed George Bush a letter uh, that was written by him and I would say very well written. written. Mm. Um, and he uh, basically was telling about the condition of the African American and uh, respectfully was asking uh, President Bush to put this on top of the agenda. Mm. What, do, what do you um, think about uh, his method of, of uh, activism and how much courage it took to do that? At that particular time, it took a lot of courage, but at that particular time also, the atmosphere in society was re-Afrocentrism. -Africa, re Mm, okay. So he felt, you know, not to disc uh, discredit anything that the brother did at that particular time because that was the time that he was living in. But at the same time, you know, that's, it was a few years after the Malcolm X or just before the Malcolm X movie came out with Denzel Washington. So this reaffirmation of Afrocentrism came out. That was the plight of the society. We're just coming out of crack or what crack was really heavy in our society. So, you know, it, it fit the time, but you're saying 1991 is 2020. So now brothers like that, so where do we, where, it goes back to the point earlier, where's the coalition that developed from that? Mm. There is no coalition, so there's no consistency. It's always a break. Mm, okay. You know, there's no consistency. So why should anybody in power take you serious when you break upon yourself? Right. Well, hey, ma'am, it's... Uh very, uh, very, very interesting uh, subject. And this is uh, part one of a series that we're going to be, be doing. And I would just like to uh, thank you for your very insightful uh, knowledge um, about the Quran and also about sports, um, your, your expertise in, in all these areas um, have made you a, a tremendous uh, guest. And I'd like to thank uh, the audience, and we will be having more shows uh, concerning um, Islamic uh, jurisprudence, Islamic health, and uh, uh, general information about uh, Islamic uh, studies as it relates to our community. And I'd like to thank uh, Davis Media Assets for giving us this platform, and thank you very much, and please watch again. Thank you.